My scripture reading this morning will be from 1 John 2, verses 1 through 6. 1 John 2, verses 1 through 6. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. But this we know, that we, that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Just this morning in the high school class, I was asking the young people, where did we get chapters and verses? Because when inspired writers of the Bible wrote down uh, the will of God for the people to read and to know and to f understand and follow, there were no chapters and verses. That's something that man came along later and not problematically, in fact, very helpfully, inserted into scripture so that we could understand where things are a little bit better and we could find them together a little bit more easily. But I say that because this morning we continue our study of 1 John and we do so by jumping into a second chapter which does not mean that it's a completely new thought. In fact, it's a continuation of what John had been talking about in chapter 1. In the previous two lessons that we talked about regarding the book of 1 John, we talked about how the nature of God is absolute purity. And as we are the creation of God made in his image, our nature is absolute purity. However, our condition is impurity because we have chosen to abandon how God made us and to give in to temptation and sin. And so there is a gap that exists between God and man. And that gap or the glue that can bring those two pieces of the puzzle together lives in the form of Jesus Christ. And Jesus would say to us in verse 7 of chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us of all sin. The idea that even as children of God, as John himself is writing this letter to a group of Christians, even as children of God, we make mistakes. But that doesn't mean we have to walk in the light. Even though we make mistakes, we get back on track. We ask for forgiveness. We do what is necessary to demonstrate to God and others the penitence that we feel in our hearts as we strive to walk in the footsteps of the Savior. That then brings us to this morning's lesson in 1 John chapter 2. It is in this passage of scripture that John begins by talking about or talking to his children. Now these children are not his personal offspring, but we would liken it to the way Paul addressed Timothy and also Titus as sons in the faith. John felt very close to these recipients. And as an apostle of Jesus and as an elder in the first century church and an inspired writer who writes these words before us, we see him talking to a group of people that he cares very much for, that he sees in so many ways as families, as we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but he sees them in a very unique way, much like a parent would to an offspring. He sees them as children who are still growing and who are still learning. And he gives them these words of instruction and admonition and encouragement to remind them of that point that they are still growing and that he wants them to continue to grow and do so successfully in the faith. 
In these first two verses of Scripture, I want to share with you something before we get into the theme or the title of our lesson because these two words in some way connect what we've been talking about with what we are talking about this morning. He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Remember the last three verses, which are at the end of chapter one, are dealing with this idea of don't pretend you don't sin. It makes you out to be a liar. And if you proclaim it, you're actually arguing that God is not being honest. And that, of course, cannot be. He inserts in the middle of those verses a passage where he says that we need to be faithful. God is always faithful to us. We need to be faithful to him and in our responsibilities to him by owning up to when we do wrong and what we've done that is wrong and acknowledging that wrong through confession and repentance so that we can receive forgiveness. But he challenges those first century Christians and he challenges us today with the things that he's writing that we remember that our place as children of God is not to sin. It doesn't mean we don't sin, but we have to remember that our responsibility here is to do better than live the lives we used to live separate and apart from the Lord. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. There's that glue. There's our attorney. There's the middleman who stands for us and defends us. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. I want to point out something that we see there in the very first verse, and I'm going to reference things. I realize that the red font on your screen, at least here in the auditorium, is kind of hard to read. But that particular passage of Scripture that I have under the passage on the screen behind me is a reference to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 7. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 7. And when Paul was writing the church at Rome, he in so many ways, at least in my thinking, mirrors what John is saying to the group of Christians to whom he is writing his letter. Paul would say in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 7, to people who have been baptized into the blood of Jesus, to people who have accepted and received the grace of God, to people who have been transferred out of darkness and placed in the marvelous light of the Lord, to those people who have had their sins forgiven, thus they were saved. To those people, Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, remember something that Paul is not saying, once you're saved, you'll never sin again. He's talking about exactly what John has been talking about. Where are we living? Where are we residing spiritually? Is it in the Lord or away from the Lord? Are we striving to walk in the light or are we striving to walk in darkness? And what Paul says to the church at Rome is, if you have been baptized into Christ, you're a new creation. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's our intention. Not only has God made us clean, but the blood of Jesus as we walk in the light continues to cleanse us of all sins. But what happens if we stop walking in the light? What happens if we turn and we start headed toward darkness? What happens if we embrace the world and its sin all over again? You see, the blood of Jesus is not effective to those who do not want it. And if you want it, you've got to demonstrate it. You can't just speak. You cannot just utter the words, I believe, and not back it with something. And that's what this morning's lesson is going to be all about. Paul would continue in verse 5, If we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. 
Paul says much the same thing. We are to live Christian lives. As children of God, we are to live godly lives, and we are to grow and mature in that spiritual conduct and in that spiritual thinking and in that spiritual way of living. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. Right there in the second verse, you might see it up here, he uses the term propitiation. It's kind of a big word. We don't use it a lot in our day-to-day -day language, but the Bible uses it several times. And the idea here is that Jesus is the payoff or he paid the price for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. The Hebrews writer would reiterate this in another passage of Scripture I have on the screen there, Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18, where it is written, Therefore he, talking about Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, in other words, in the flesh, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation or pay off the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he was suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus lived as one of us. Jesus understands us. He understands what it's like to be tempted in the flesh, but he overcame that temptation, lived the perfect life, which was the only life that would be satisfactory to the Father to pay off the sins of the world and to offer us the possibility of eternal life in heaven. So this morning what we're going to do with those two verses at, used as an introduction, we're going to make two very simple points out of the following three before we conclude with verse 6. We're going to talk about this morning if we keep his commandments. And this of course is from in its entirety 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. But again I want you to look for these phrases. I want you to look for this phrase in particular. If we keep his commandments because the bottom line is it is a conditional topic that we are studying this morning because thus far it has been a conditional topic the Bible has been addressing. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us of all sin. That's what last chapter verse 7 taught us and it taught us that these things are conditional because God never makes us saved and makes us stay saved against our will. Will. We are the ones who choose him. He has made the free gift of salvation available, but we are the ones who must listen to him. We are the ones who must walk with him and talk with him and ultimately keep his commandments. So we're going to take a look at that conditional topic. What happens if we keep his commandments? We're going to first and foremost go to verse 3 and 4. And we're going to find our first answer in those two verses of Scripture. And you'll be mindful that these answers as well as the question are right out of the text. The question, if we keep his commandments, what then? Well, according to verses 3 and 4, we will come to know him. That's what we actually read. Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. In other words, if we don't keep his commandments, we cannot come to know him. And understand this is not simple knowledge, but this is intimate knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that we have with someone who is very close to us, maybe a family member or a very close friend as Jesus will compare himself to us later if we keep his commandments. So if we keep his commandments, we will come to know him. Verse 4 reads, the one who says says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, perhaps that particular verse of scripture goes a little challenged in our thinking because we sometimes don't realize how close this knowledge of him is supposed to be. But I guess it would be tantamount to this, especially in verse 4. If I were to go out there and to call any other woman in this world other than my wife Sherry, if I were to call her my spouse, would that make it so? Well, of course not. And in fact, you'd think very strange of me, and rightfully so, if I did such a thing. 
To just say the words is insufficient. And to just say that you know God when you really don't know him, neither in knowledge or in deed, to say it is simply insufficient. I want you to consider what Jesus would say back in the book of John, the gospel of John, on so many occasions. He would say that being my disciples, declaring yourself my disciple, calling yourself my friend is just not enough. There has to be action. There has to be mental action and physical action backing up those words or else they are just empty. John 14 and verse 15, Jesus would say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's a whole world of religion out there that says quite the contrary to this. They say, if you love Jesus, just mutter a few words and then everything else for the rest of your life will be okay. No, it's not okay. If you're not walking in the light, if you are not keeping his commandments, if you are not abiding in his will for your life, living in his will for your life, then there's something missing. And that which is missing can cost us eternity. If we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. This is one of the very last things Jesus leaves with his disciples in the Great Commission according to Matthew. Is not only after we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he goes on to say, and then we teach them to observe all that he's commanded. Then he is with us even to the very end of the age. But the idea there is that we keep his commandments, that we not just talk about how much we love him, but we show Show him how much we love him. In John 14, verses 23 and 24, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, this is not really two completely different thoughts. On one, in one verse, verse 15, he talks about keeping his commandments. The next time he talks about keeping his word. He's not talking about keeping a secret, but he's talking about abiding in his will. Those words that he has taught, those words which are the precious words of life. These are the kinds of words that we are to not only mentally know, but that we are to actually keep in the very way we live. John 15 and verse 10 reads, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus was the perfect example. Jesus did not just spout off tales with nothing to back it up. He backed it up with his attitude. He backed it up with his actions. He backed it up with his compassion and his love for every soul of man, even those who hated him to the point of crucifying him on the cross. He backed up the will of his father in his life in more than just words. And now he asks us to do the same thing. The wonderful blessing about this is if we do that, if we live our lives like he lived his life, what he's saying is there will be a oneness, not simply between the Father and the Son, but between God and man that it is difficult to describe to anyone outside of that relationship. We will have a oneness. We will have a unity that presents for us a joy in living and a peace that passes all understanding. John 15 verses 1, 14 through 16. John 15 verses 14 through 16 reads, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, I want to jump to verse 16 and do what I do sometimes and go backward, because I want to point this out. The purpose of our relationship with Jesus is obviously to be saved, but his purpose for our life is that we bear fruit. Verse 16, I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. 
The idea of bearing fruit is that you do something about it. The idea is that you live in a certain way is to demonstrate God in you. We asked the question several weeks ago in a lesson, and I reiterate this point today, uh, a point that when one of our members posted it on our social media account, some people in the world seemed to argue with her, seemed to say, suggest it's not true. Uh, but I go back to that point. If people don't know that you're a Christian, if people have to ask if you're a Christian, there may be something wrong. When you go up to an apple tree, and there are no apples during the season where they should be growing, are you going to ask, is this an apple tree? And if so, what's wrong? Or are you just going to assume everything's good? We live in orange country. When the orchards uh, bring forth the oranges and you see row after row as you drive down the highway of orange trees after orange trees producing oranges after oranges. And then you come upon this one tree that's as big as all the others. It's been being fed and watered like all the others, but it's not producing. Do you not wonder what's wrong? Why is that tree not doing what that tree is supposed to do? Jesus is saying the same thing. If we claim to be his friend, then why aren't we being very friendly? Why aren't we being friendly to him and why aren't we being friendly to others in the bearing of that fruit that might reach their lives and bring to them the hope of salvation? Verse 14, where we begin, simply says, if you are my friends, or you are my friends, if you do what I command you. And so in that passage of Scripture, we realize that we are Christians we are Christ-like if, in fact, we are like Christ. We are his friends if we behave as a friend does to another friend. And we do for that friend and we serve that friend. And in this case, we serve our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, one of the three verses that we talked about just prior to our text this morning, reads the following. If we say that we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Ultimately, the idea here is that we not sin and that we live godly lives. Will we make mistakes? Absolutely. But that's a part of walking in the light, making mistakes, asking for forgiveness, and getting back on track. Why? Because our goal is heaven. Jesus is the one who's in our sights, and we are striving to walk closer to him every single day. We do make mistakes. We do sin, but we strive to do better each and every day. And by demonstrating faithful Christian living, we demonstrate not only to our God, but we demonstrate to the world around us that we are, in fact, lovers of our Lord, that we love him so much that we will, in fact, keep his commandments. Now, I want you to notice the screen up behind me. It starts off by saying, if we keep his commandments. We're going to now move to verse 5. And if you'll notice, verse 5 does not actually use that terminology, if we keep his commandments. But it does use something that in principle is identical to it when he says, whoever keeps his word. Now, this is not talking about whether you tell the truth. We use that sometimes uh, very commonly, you know, don't forget to keep your word. We're telling somebody, don't forget to live up to what you said you were going to do or to be honest or something like that. Somebody who doesn't keep his word is a liar. But this kind of keeping is more along the line of a word we're going to see used very frequently at this point, the word abide. And it means to live in. So what we're saying is we need to live live in the Word of God. We need to live by the Word of God. We need to uh, be seen as people of the Word of God. And a lot of times in years past, maybe decades past, unfortunately, the Lord's church used to be known as a people of the Bible. 
as it was pointed out last week by our guest speakers, sometimes that's not always the case these days. We don't know our Bibles like we should, and we need to all be better students of His Word so that we can not simply know it, but so that we can keep it so that we can abide in it. Verse 5 reads, But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know we are in him. Now let's take a look at this. If we keep his commandments, or in this case, whoever keeps his word according to the text, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. A lot of people get real uncomfortable using the word perfect because we all know that by ourselves we are not, or at least we should. Separate and apart from God and His grace, separate and apart from the Son and His blood, we are not perfect, and nor would we ever be without Him. But with Him we are perfect. With Him we are perfected. Some translations will use words like whole and mature, and I'm going to make that point in just a second with a different passage of reading. But we understand that what we're saying here is where we are incomplete, where we are not whole, God makes us complete and makes Him whole. And it is His design for us. It is in Him that His love, the love of God, has truly been perfected. Or in other words, it has been made what he intended it to be all along. But that's if we keep his commandments. That's if we keep his word. I want you to take a look at Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. It is in this passage of scripture that we read about Jesus, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, I've always had a little bit of a trouble when somebody talks about their big, their big brother Jesus. It's kind of like when they call God the Father Dad. I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with these familial relationships. We use them in our families and we understand them, but sometimes I just, I guess it's the way I was raised. It just seems a little bit lacking in respect, but that's just an opinion, okay? But when I see this passage of Scripture, what we're seeing is that as Jesus submitted to the Heavenly Father, and then in like manner is able to call those of us who submit his brethren or his brothers and sisters in this great family of God. He says, this is what I want you to strive for. I want you to strive to be brethren. I want you to strive to be a part of this family. Now, we go back to that statement, but whoever keeps his word. This is the condition that the love of God will be made perfect in us, that it will be what it's intended to be, that it will bring about what it's intended to bring about, and that's the salvation of the lost. When we keep his word, we have to understand the importance of it. I go to a passage of scripture that is familiar to most all of us, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. It's a scripture where Paul says to the young preacher Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, the, the King James Version says here uh, that uh, the man of God may be uh, perfect. One translation says, so that the man of God may be adequate. But the idea here is that we be whole. And we cannot be whole by ourselves, but we can be whole with the help of God. With everything that he brings to the table and simply asks us to love him in return. But not love him with the emptiness of words, not only. But rather to make those words mean something by backing them up with action. This is why Paul, going back to the book of Romans, would say to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
In other words, what God intended to happen is not that every soul of man be lost, but that every soul of man be saved forever with him in that eternal home called heaven. Why would Jesus go back and prepare a place for us if none of us were ever going to get there? And none of us can get there of our own meritorious works, but we can get there through his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, through his love, which allows us a path to follow. And he expects us to walk that path. He expects us to journey through the life of Christianity, living like him and living for him. Uh, not being like we used to be, not conforming to the world, but like a caterpillar to a butterfly, being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that mind is not only what governs what we think, it's the mind that governs what we do. So Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now some people will read this passage of Scripture and say, well, that's the problem with the whole premise behind your lesson, Kevin. None of us are ever going to be perfect. You just said, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit. And well, I'm just not going to do that. It's not to say that we cannot. Remember, God always gives us the opportunity to overcome temptation and sin. But I agree with you, we don't. I agree with you, I don't. I make mistakes. I transgress the will of God. I sin. What happens next means everything in the world. Do I care about the one that I just hurt? Do I care about the one who went to the cross to give me the freedom or the pardon of my sin? If I don't care, not much will happen. And therefore, that, that which is good will never exist. That which is acceptable will never exist. That which is perfect will never be made whole. But if I realize as a child of God how I've hurt my God with my sin, if I realize how wrong it is to live that kind of life, to think those kind of thoughts, to say those kinds of things, to go those kinds of places, to hang out with those kind of people that are going to pull me down rather than me lift them up. If that's the life that I'm going to live, it's going to be problematic. But if I can walk in the light, if I can live according to his will, if I can be transformed by the renewing of my, my mind to not only accept that I'm a new creation, but I can live as a new creation for Jesus, then everything will be made whole. Everything in God's eyes will be complete, and I can be saved in the end. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 is a wonderful verse of scripture. It's a wonderful introduction to James. I love the fact that James spends absolutely no time jumping straight into it. We talk about Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia. He spends five verses in his introduction before verse 6 when he really gets down to business. James spends one and in verse 2 jumps right down to business. And he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Trials are not considered to be a, a positive thing, but biblically they are. Why? Because knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let dear endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Do you know what all this means? It means if we try to live as a child of God, if we try to be Christians, then we're going to have struggles. And as we have those struggles, if we try even harder to live more like a Christian, we're going to have blessings. Now see, that's where some people give up. They don't understand the road ahead. They haven't counted the cost of Christianity. And so when trials come their way, maybe kind of like the parable of the sower, when we talk about the seed that's thrown upon the rocky soil, it grows up, but then in time of temptation withers away. We can't be like that. Whether we're young in the faith or older in the faith, we have to continue to persevere. We have to endure. We have to stand strong against the tide that may try to wash us away. In so doing, endurance will have its perfect result so that we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
You know, it's interesting. The Bible teaches us and taught us in the first century that everything pertaining to life and godliness we have. It's already been revealed to us. It's already been given to us. We're not waiting for some new revelation. We're not waiting for new, some new set of instructions. Everything that we need to know about how to live in this life so that we can live in the life to come has already been revealed to us. The challenge is, will we be about our Father's business? Will we get up and go on about it? Will we be doers of the Word or will we be hearers only? Well, we know the end of that. That's, that we can't do that. We have to be those people who listen but we have to be those p people who live as well. It's interesting in the very last verse of Scripture, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, we read a verse of Scripture that makes me read, uh, think of the very first t-shirt, the very first church t-shirt I ever had any involvement in putting together. It was a couple of decades ago now when I preached in Anthony, Kansas, and we didn't know enough back then to get a colored shirt. We just thought being able to print anything unique on a shirt was cool. So we all had white shirts. Uh, but we had a guy who on the front of the shirt or on the back of the shirt uh, was a guy who seemed to have an awful lot of tongue. <laughs> In other words, he's sitting there and, and he's got this really big mouth and big tongue hanging out of it. And the challenge at the bottom of it was you can talk the talk but can you walk the walk? And on the front side of that shirt was this passage of Scripture from 1 John 2 and verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In other words, if you claim to be a Christian this morning, there has to be more than just your claim. If you claim to be a child of God, are you obedient to the Father? If you claim to abide in him, does he abide in you? Because the only way that he abides in you and we in him is if we keep his commandments and thereby fulfill his perfect love and his perfect plan for us. Do we love him? Then let us keep his commandments. If we walk like him, then we will please him in everything that we do. There's one more passage of Scripture that's included up here. It's in John chapter 15, verses 4 through 11. John chapter 15, verses 4 through 11. It's in this passage of Scripture that Jesus himself would say the following. He would say, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, he can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. It's no coincidence that the same John who wrote 1 John wrote the Gospel of John and uses some of the same language and terminology as he quotes Jesus here. Abiding in me, demonstrating your love, proving that you are a disciple. Once again, I ask you, consider verse 8. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit. If we do not bear fruit... If we do not put into actions our faith, that faith is an empty faith, and the Father cannot and will not be glorified by an empty faith. But if we do bear much fruit, not only will the Father be glorified, but look at the end of verse 8, and so you will prove to be my disciples. You know, we have a saying. When somebody makes a claim, we say, prove it. And you know what the Bible says? If you claim to be a child of God, if you claim to be a Christian, 
If you claim to love the Father, if you claim to follow the Son, if you claim to be a, a follower of the words of God as revealed to us in the Spirit, if you claim to be that uh, Bible baying and quoting and toting child of God, if you claim these claims, the Bible says prove it. Prove it. Don't just talk about it. A lot of people can talk the talk and do talk the talk. John challenges us. Jesus challenges us to prove it and walk the walk. This morning, are you walking the walk? There may be some this morning here who have never put on Jesus Christ in baptism. Now, they've heard the word of God preached. They understand that there's sin in their lives. They may understand they are outside of Christ and lost in this world. And I've heard some people say, well, let me get my life in order before I become a Christian, and, and then I'll start getting serious about it. That's not how that works. You can't get your life in order by yourself. You need the blood of Jesus for that to happen. So if you have not put on Christ in baptism after repenting of your sins and confessing his name, why not do that this morning? There is no better time to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, to rise up a new creation. And as I generally mention, the people who are gathered here in front of me and maybe the people who are gathering, watching us online, maybe these people are people who claim to be children of God. Maybe in fact they are members of the body of Christ, but would anybody know it? Are your actions glorifying of God? Do other people truly see Christ in you without having to ask about what they're seeing? If that's the case, if people are unsure as to your Christianity because of things you've been saying or things you've been doing, the life you've been living, there's no better time for you to make a change. With a penitent heart asking God for forgiveness and with the help of brothers and sisters in Christ, lifting you up in prayer so that his will be done in you and through you. That's something we want to do with you. If we can help you to come back to the fold, if we can help you to walk better that journey into the light, all we ask that you do is let us know how we can while together we stand and sing.